Thanks, Sheena, and welcome everybody. Uh, we've got three scholars. Um, to me, they seem very recent scholars. Uh, we've got uh, Helen Bricker, uh, David Cass, and Emma Finn, who all went and spent time in Florence as part of the John Kinross Scholarship. Uh, the Kinross Scholarship, as many of you will know, is a very generous uh, scholarship. Ten recent graduates uh, get to go and spend three months or so in uh, Florence or Italy every year. Um, and over the 40 years that the scholarship's been running, 40 plus years, uh, about 450 uh, recent graduates in Scotland have received the opportunity. So we'll just start straight away. We're going to start with Kellen Bricker, who's a vis British visual artist who explores technology and our relationship to nature. He explores these themes across a range of media, working with AI technology, as well as painting, printmaking, and installation. Kellen has shown his work widely in Europe, North America, and Asia. He has had his work covered in Forbes and was recently invited as a speaker to the World Artificial Intelligence Conference in Shanghai. Kellen was a Kinross scholar in 2012. And Kellen, I wonder if you could start off by telling us where you are and what the time is. Yes, thanks, Mary. Uh, I am calling from Beijing, actually, uh, where it is um, five minutes past two in the morning, but very happy to be here, nevertheless. Good. Do you want to just launch into your- Launch in, right, okay. Yes, let me get- Hi. Is that uh, visible? Perfect, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm just going to firstly explain a little bit about the project I did in Italy uh, and then about the work I've been doing uh, since then. So my time in Florence, um, as Mary just mentioned, I was there in 2012. Uh, just shortly after graduating. And at that time, um, my practice was what you might call social practice. I was working a lot on uh, art projects that would engage with a community or group of people. Um, and when I got to Florence, uh, the particular community I wanted to, to work with um, was actually the, the migrant community. Um, as I said, I was there 2012, 2013, it was actually a couple of years before what people would later call the, um, the migrant crisis, which was more sort of 2015 or so, um, really hit Europe. Um, but nevertheless, it was still an issue in Florence at the time, um, or that the, um, the situation was, was something that um, I wanted to, to address in my artwork. So after about a month of being there and spending a lot of time um, with people like Aziz here, who was uh, selling uh, posters and, and uh, sort of counterfeits on, on the street, I came across this um, organization called Inelli Mancanti, who I started to work with. Um, this, is, this is a center that um, helps migrants arriving into, uh, into Italy. Um, and I started off there first um, doing some volunteer teaching. Uh, and then I did these sort of small um, collaborative projects um, with the community there, these kinds of um, collaborative paintings. Um, bringing together the, uh, the community of Nelly Mancanti and then also the, the local Italian community. But I, um, after getting to know them better, I decided I wanted to do a slightly more ambitious project that was um, more directly referencing Florence um, and engaging the community in a different way. So I wanted to, to use this building, the, um, the baptistry, and particularly the, the doors on the baptistry. So you may know if you've been to Florence or you... Uh, did any art history that there is there are these three doors on the on the baptistry there's the north doors uh, the east and the south um the north and the east by Ghiberti and the south by Pisano uh, this is the most famous one uh, most people may may recognize which is the, the gates of paradise but then on the the north and the south doors there's a particular um compositional device which I thought was interesting which was this which is the, the quatrefoil so I wanted to use this um, compositional device and um, I decided I was going to take this, uh, this form to the community I was working with and ask them to replace the content of these 
um, quatrefoils, replace the traditional content with, with the stories, their stories and their perspective. So this is sort of what I was doing. Um, I took this shape to them and I asked them to draw how they had imagined Italy before they arrived. What were their hopes? What were their expectations? How did they imagine it was going to be before they made the journey to Italy? And um, there was a huge range of responses. Um, I'll show a, a few of them now. Um, this is from Diop, and you can see he was thinking about a home, I think. Uh, this is what I would do with the images. I would take their drawings and then place them inside this um, quatrefoil form. So this is Diop from Senegal. Sorry. Um, this would be, this is Rabo from Bangladesh and, and the, the small image he drew there in the center is a, actually a, um, a factory. So he was talking to me about work. Obviously that was something that he was hoping to, to get in Italy. Um, this is Ashur from Syria who, he was actually an architect, um, but had to leave Syria under, you know, unfortunate circumstances. But then this was his kind of overriding expectation or, or hope for um, his time in Italy. Uh, we had uh, some interesting responses, a bit like this, from quite a few people. Um, this is Yusuf from Egypt, uh, and he's kind of combined many of the what you might think of as stereotypes of, of Italy. Uh, you have the Pope on a bridge with a gondola underneath, uh, with a Duomo behind him, and the sort of football match going on uh, somewhere down the left corner. So um, there were sort of these humorous responses in a way, um, and then more serious ones, though Aziz. Uh, painted this quite, um, you know, cheerful looking image uh, underneath, you might be able to make out the words, uh, please help me. So I collected these images together and then made my fourth door, which was this um, new kind of door to Europe, if you like, or uh, this new door for the baptistry. Um, the people who made up this image, this, this is 35, I was, I was working with a lot more over the course of my time in Florence. Um, but this sort of represented um, the breadth of the community, because in fact, they were from absolutely everywhere. Um, it wasn't just, um, well, they were from all over Africa, you know, all four corners of Africa and, and the Middle East. But then also people arriving in Italy um, from, from the global south generally. So from South America, from Southeast Asia, um, and all of them bringing these sort of different perspectives, different hopes and expectations. Um, the choice of the baptistry as th this door was also um, important because um, until the 19th century, actually, the baptistry was the place where all Florentine citizens were baptized. So there was this quite interesting connection to the idea of, uh, of citizenship in a way also. And of course, the door also being a kind of um, portal or a barrier. Um, this is also something I was thinking about. This is the, the piece actually installed in the Anelli Mancanti. I, I gave the RSA one version, and then I also uh, have one version, or had one version in Florence in the um, Nelly Mancanti. So uh, that was what I was up to in Florence. Um, and I'll just try and quickly go through some more work that I've been doing since then. Um, and sort of, you can see the influence, I think, of my time in Florence. Um, so perhaps attracted to the idea of living internationally, I came uh, from Florence to China. Um, and I started working also with uh, a migrant community, but it's, it's a different kind of community. It's the migrant worker community in China. Uh, here, I was asking them to, to make this kind of collaborative work um, using tools, which we, we dipped in paint and then made these kind of banners, which were then also used in community settings in these kinds of uh, community theaters. Um, and then even taken on tour by this feminist folk band um, who they have music which relates to the the migrant uh, situation in China. I was also able, and uh, was quite lucky to be able to get into a factory where I was a, did a different kind of project. Um, also again, kind of collaborative, uh, collaborative piece. Um, this is Zhao Tao. Um, he's working in this factory in Beijing and his job is to spray paint this blue thing you might be able to see in the middle, which is a kind of um, turbine. Um, so my idea was I collected the, the waste cloths that were, had been used in the factory and I, I placed them in the back of his spray booth. 
which you can kind of see there. Um, <clears throat> and so while he was working, he was also spraying these cloths, which I then later collected and then um, combined into this um, piece, which I then hung in the factory. So while he's working, he can see this piece that he, he made. And I was, part of the work was this uh, relationship with him in a way, but then it was also um, kind of a joke about uh, efficiency because I was actually making the factory more efficient because it was producing artwork at the same time as, uh, as turbines. Um, but Zhao Tao himself got into, um, got a taste for making art and ended up on the cover of um, this magazine, Art World, which was a nice, uh, nice thing to see. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I got left. Uh, I'll try and go through the, the last few things. Um, got so, minutes five minutes? Okay. So, uh, people like Zhao Tao and the others uh, that I've been working with in China, um, one of their concerns actually is uh, what you might call a technological replacement or being replaced by a, a machine. Um, this is a kind of issue that you know people are, are facing everywhere in a way. Um, People were talking a lot about it in terms of like truck drivers getting there, being replaced by um, AI or machines or things like that. Um, so anyway, this is a this was a work that I made last year um, relating to this idea um, to try and explain it in brief. I have a friend in Mexico and, and he told me in Mexico, um, you can pay your taxes with art, which was very interesting to me. Um, it's the first time I'd ever heard of this kind of policy. Um, and at the time, uh, after my experience in these factories, I've been thinking about the question of whether um, a machine should pay tax. Should an AI pay tax or a machine? Because if it's taking someone out of the workforce, should it itself be paying tax? Uh, this is something that Bill Gates and others have mentioned, this idea. I was kind of interested in it. Um, anyway. Uh, after my friend told me this, I thought it'd be an interesting opportunity so um, to kind of explore it. So I made these works where I gave an AI some text, which it then turned into an image. Um, the text was quite abstract, um, but they were, it was all based around different technological ideas. Um, so this was a quote from Elon Musk, for example, which the AI kind of generated this quite strange image. Anyway, we did this for about uh, 20 images, 20 different texts, um, and then submitted it to the Mexican government to see if they would accept it, which in fact they did. Um, so this was a, a kind of way of um, exploring you know, some ideas about AI and art, you know, is an image made by AI, is it art? Um, but as well as this thing about tax and, and other things of this kind. Um, so this interest in AI kind of has moved into other parts of my work. And I'm just going to finish by talking about my two most recent projects, uh, which are actually more environmentally related. Um, they're still um, about, um, I guess, the, the impact the impact I hope art can have, but in a slightly different direction. Um, so this is a piece that is a, a coral reef generated by, by a machine, basically. But when people get close to it, it's an interactive thing. So when people get close to it, it's a, the corals turn turn white. Um, this was part of a, another a separate project, which was about some um, coral bleaching and um, and this kind of uh, thing. But this was a way to for people to experience this uh, in a kind of accelerated uh, time frame. Um, and this issue is something that, particularly in China, at least people are not very aware of. So it was kind of interesting to to use art in this way to, to raise awareness of this issue. Um, I'll, I'll, if there's time for a quick video of it. So as you get close, you just have this sort of whitening effect that, are, that emerges. And finally, the, the work I'm doing at the moment is thinking about um, moving art from something that is only purely communicating an issue or is representing an issue to something actually that may be able to solve it. So here I'm looking at um, something that you may or may not know, may or may not know about, but it's this issue of um, bird collisions with 
glass. It's a biodiversity issue. So birds often will fly into buildings um, and be killed by the, the contact with the glass. In the studies in the US suggest that about 1 billion per year can die in this way, uh, which is kind of a huge statistic. Anyway, um, after I'd been reading about this, I discovered that birds actually are able, many birds are able to see uh, UV light, unlike humans. So I've been working on this idea of a kind of UV glass, which would be uh, transparent to humans, but then it would be um, visible to birds. So this would be what a bird would see, would be this um, blue glass um, effect. But to a human, it would be transparent, as you can see the rest of the time. I've been trialing some tests of this kind of work um, by applying the UV to, uh, to different glass buildings, um, trying to kind of bring arts uh, yeah, into this public space um, with it also having um, a kind of biodiversity supporting um, impact. So the ultimate aim would be to um, be able to do this on a huge scale, kind of bringing it into, um, into buildings um, and sort of uh, of this size, um, also being a way to, to kind of transform the fabric of the, the, the building in a sense. It could be, it would look normal during the day, but then it could be totally transformed at night. Um, so those are some of the things I've been doing since Florence. Um, you can see that I, I've, um, I, I'm still working with communities. I just wanted to share these kind of more environmental projects that I've been doing um, in the last year, um, particularly because I'm um, uh, interested in, in um, what art can do in this space, particularly in relates to the, uh, as it relates to the environment. So um, thank you for um, having me and look forward to any uh, questions or um, yeah, talking to people afterwards, hopefully about, about, uh, about this. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you Kellen. That's really, really interesting. Um, and, and this issue of uh, engaging with people and working with people and how to make that into art that is meaningful for everybody is, is something that uh, uh, interests me a lot and uh, it's sort of you know the idea of ownership and where that lies and is it an issue and, and so on mm. is, is that something that you think about at all? Yes. It <laughs> Perhaps it doesn't matter. Uh, yes definitely. Um, in a way when I was making the work in Florence and other work since there is there's always a tension between um, your sort of will as an artist and the and then the the work that the people is sort of you're encouraging them to make, um, uh, and in a way that I sort of moved slightly away from social practice um, because of that tension um, later, and then I think that's partly why I found working with um, these environmental themes is is sort of less complicated in that sense. Um, however, um, I still hope that the projects I did with, the, with in Florence and, and also in the factories were still beneficial to the people that I was working with. I'm sure it would, would have been. Um, just having somebody to listen to you and take you seriously is, is an important yes. thing, quite apart from anything else. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, I guess our time is limited. So thank yeah. you, Kellen, and thank we'll you. move on now to David Cass, who is our next speaker. Um, now, David's um, ar artistic approach is wide ranging, each project anchored by sustainability and environmental campaign. So perhaps the two of you will have something to talk about. Um, while painting and construction are the art forms he uses most often, his recent projects also involve photography and audience participation. Bound by their use of gathered and recycled materials, David's artworks each investigate water in some way. Often these works explore past examples of extreme weather events, and I presume you'll be talking about Florence in that context, 
drawing parallels with the climate change driven weather patterns we're seeing around the world today. David was awarded first place in the Royal Watercolour Society's Contemporary Competition in 2012 and received Royal Scottish Academy's Benno Schott's Park Prize in 2018, as well as participating in residences in Iceland and Athens. David was a John Kinross scholar, and I've written here in 2001, but I think it was 2010, wasn't it? 2010, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, David, do you want to tell us where you are and what the time is there? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in Greece. I'm in Athens, and it's, uh, it's 20 past nine. Um, I'm dividing this year between the Scottish borders where I'm from and, uh, and here. So I'll just I'll just uh, begin. Um, I'm going to switch over to see if I can get the slideshow started. Let me know if you can see that. Yes, that's lovely. Great. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm speaking to you from from Athens tonight. Uh, I participated in the John Kinross Scholarship in 2010. The same year that I graduated from Edinburgh College of Art, the School of Drawing and Painting. I'm going to go on to explain a little bit about how the scholarship has influenced the artist I am today um, and how it instilled in me the desire to travel, to work abroad, particularly on mainland Europe, uh, as often as possible. The main focus for this presentation, as you said, Mary, is um, uh, an environmental theme. So it's, it's my focus on the Florence flood of 1966. Uh, however, before I go more deeply into that topic, um, I'm just gonna give you a rough overview of the kind of artworks I, I make mostly, uh, some pieces from the last decade. So um, I'm probably best known for my paintings of water upon found objects. Like I said, I make travel an important aspect of my artwork, and this includes scouring the flea markets of France, Belgium, Italy, and Spain to find surfaces to paint on, from wooden panels, doors, uh, drawers, like in this piece, to metal road signs, advertisement plaques, and once even a copper boiler, as you can see here on the right. Uh, I paint upon these in either watercolour or in oil, depending on the surface itself. And the artworks mostly have some kind of uh, environmental subtext. The, this recent exhibition here, it's called Rising Horizon. This was in the Scottish Gallery a couple of years ago and explored the issue of rising global sea levels. Sorry, the, the slide shows behaving uh, on its own. Uh, so yeah, that was called Rising Horizon, and it discussed sea level rise. The work I make today still uses found objects, as it did when I was in Florence, on the scholarship. And I'd source these at Florence's antiques market, or those in the surrounding towns like Luca, which had a fantastic monthly flea market. My subject since art school has been water, uh, water in all its forms. So when I learned of Florence's great flood, I knew that my artwork had to explore the history of this extreme event. I'd seen the plaques like this one here, uh, etched throughout the city, but it wasn't actually until a fellow scholar, Stephen Kavanagh, introduced me to the topic of the flood properly that I really began to look more deeply into this. These lines seen here in this plaque are evident on most street corners around Florence and they're mostly above head height charting exactly where the water reached that day in November 1966. In a single night, the birthplace of the Renaissance was reduced to a sea of mud. That was on the 4th of November, 66. Engulfing some of the world's most famous buildings, sites, and works of art, and claiming over 100 lives. Had it not been Armed Forces Day the previous day, and a holiday the day of the flood, that count would surely have been significantly higher for the floodwaters entered the city when most people would have been heading to work. The legacy of the flood still lives on in Florence today. So the flood was the result of extreme rain, a subsequent bursting of not one, but two dams in the valley south of Florence. 
the water hit the city at around 60 kilometers per hour, carrying animals, cars, debris, and trees in its wake. The water became contaminated quickly, mixing with mud and oil, and traces of that oil remain around the city today. My works seek to investigate, to illustrate imagined scenes from that day. I've employed my use of found objects to create these works with papers, postcards, books, and news clippings from the time, not only acting as supporting material, but as surfaces too. The majority of these works are in watercolor based on archive documentation and from images I took myself around the city. The scale ranges from very large works like this piece here painted onto an antique map to smaller artifact style pieces like this one, almost handheld in size. When we see flooding around Europe, as we have done a lot in recent months, my mind always goes to Florence's 1966 flood. When Florence flooded, that kind of inundation was described as a hundred year flood. And it's true, Florence has suffered an extreme flood almost every century since the 1300s. But in recent years, the Arno has been on the verge of bursting its banks often. It was just a few weeks ago that we saw Florence's twin city flooded, Edinburgh, with half a month's worth of rain falling in just one hour. And then a few days later, London saw a whole month's worth in 24 hours. So the idea of this once in a generation flood as a, is, is a thing of the past, truly. And we should probably see Florence's great flood as a cautionary tale for our time of climate crisis. In 2016, to mark the 50th anniversary of the flood, I launched this book that you see here, Perimetri Perduti. The title translates as Perimeters Lost and explores the changed shape of the flooded city, the lost boundaries, the shifted perspective, and the contemporary significance of the flood. It features artworks uh, by myself, alongside uh, texts from international authors, as well as uh, Angelo del Fango, mud angels, people who came to Florence in the aftermath of the flood to help clean and salvage. There's also some archive documentation. Um, the photographs you see here are from my own collection, these ones here. Um, these are original images taken by a local during the flood's aftermath, and they've been seen for the first time in this book. Again, I apologize for the slideshow because it's skipping on its own. As well as producing the book, I put together two solo exhibitions and a collaborative show again with fellow scholar Stephen Kavanagh, and that was in Florence. Uh, also, our, our group of 2010 scholars put together a couple of shows, one in London and one in Glasgow, after having formed close bonds during the scholarship. This is the British Institute of Florence and the Harold Acton Library. And here, sorry, again, it's going too fast. Here we have um, some of the artworks created for the book. These are all on antique papers and all painted in watercolor, except this one here, which was drawn from life uh, and just imagined where the water might end up. So Santa Croce uh, was the worst affected part of the city with water reaching 6.7 meters, which is almost unbelievable. Artworks, books, artifacts, and more are still being restored even today. And throughout this project, I was asking what if, what if this happens again? The chances are high. And from all that I've learned, it doesn't seem that the situation is any better in the city itself today in terms of flood resilience than it was in 1966. If we look northeast to Venice, the fear of flooding is further magnified despite a newly installed hydraulic flood barrier. Rising temperatures around the world make extreme weather events such as flooding even more intense. 
Quite simply, as air heats up, it contains more moisture. And so long as we keep on emitting CO2 at the levels we are today, we're likely to see more and more heavy rains and much more flooding as a result. So uh, because of my research into Florence's great flood, I, I decided to travel to London, Paris and Bilbao to look into the history of great floods there too. I created a large series of works exploring Paris's 1910 flood, some of which you can see on my website. Um, and I was heavily drawn to Venice in the years after the scholarship. It's a city which fascinates me. And next year I'll present an exhibition at the Biennale on the topic of sea level rise. Um, it treats Venice as Europe's first clear victim of rising sea levels. Coincidentally, on that fateful day in 1966, Venice also suffered a catastrophic flood. It was a result of that flood that plans were first drawn up uh, to introduce a barrier around the city, something that would take over 50 years um, to build. As a next step in this ongoing focus on water, I've moved away from exploring these great floods and now look at the slow creep of sea level rise. We know that sea levels are rising around the world, um, but what we might not know is that the, these, the rate of rise differs dramatically from place to place. Venice is sinking at a rate of one millimeter per year. And up until 1993, sea levels in the Venetian Lagoon were rising at almost 2.5 millimeters per year. Since 1993, in this period of advanced climate change, um, it could be possible that sea levels in the Venetian Lagoon, Lagoon are going up by up to 9.5 millimeters per year, which is a huge figure, almost, almost a centimeter. So at next year's Biennale, I present two artworks based on this phenomenon. The exhibition is called Where Once the Waters, and it aims to explore these localized variations in sea level rise with the intention of bringing home this topic. If you head to this web page, if you have a chance at some point after the talk, um, you can uh, fill out a form by clicking this button here. And all you need to submit is your, your first name, your birth year, and your birthplace. And I'll use this data to calculate by how much the sea level nearest your birthplace has risen across your lifetime. And I'll include this in the, the main Biennale artwork. So this, this kind of brings us to the end of my presentation, and I hope it explains the progression of my work since uh, 2010. Um, from exploring the magnificent and inspiring city of Florence, a place that I've come to love deeply, to researching one of the darkest days in its history, uh, tying that to the present day and extreme weather events, placing it within the watery history of other cultural landmarks around Europe, and then moving from exploring episodes of flooding to more permanent, the more permanent phenomenon of sea level rise and how it will impact places such as Venice. So thank you for uh, inviting me to speak and thank you to the RSA for the opportunity to be part of uh, the scholarship, which, which definitely had a huge impact on my trajectory. Uh, it's worth saying as well that as part of the current RSA show, there are three of um, my travel artworks included. It wasn't only flood artworks that I made in response to the scholarship, but also some, some more simple scenes from train windows or from walks on the Cinque Terre. So thank you. Thank you, David. That's really fascinating. Um, and I, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting to see how that historical event impacted on you. And I, what I'm wondering, I suppose, is whether the sort of the, the coincidence of that catastrophic event and the fact that there are all these treasures <laughs> in the city, as well as living people. I, I was just wondering if there's some sort of tension in there between um, how you value these different things, whether, you know, how, how do you value a, a unique artwork? Yeah, and it's, it's a good question. And the people in the streets. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the artworks, from what I understand, um, not much has changed in terms of how places like the Uffizi, for example, stores their collections. Um, I haven't heard that there's much in the way of flood protection. So 
that's obviously a, a big deal. And I don't know about the other aspect of it. I don't know what other mechanisms might be in place. I, I, I don't think there are any structural interventions within the city itself. Uh, as part of the book, Perimetri Perduti, one of the writers, uh, Candia McWilliam, she reached out to, to people in Florence to ask those very questions. And so um, I'll share a link at some point with, with a PDF of that book and you can read the responses that she got. That's interesting, thank you. Uh, and I just thought I would also mention um, that in terms of the current Andy Armo exhibition, which you, you were just mentioning at the Royal Scottish Academy, uh, it was initially intended to be in the downstairs galleries at the RSA, but because of the flood, <laughs> we are in fact in the upstairs gallery, so there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, every cloud. Okay, thank you, David. I will move on now to Emma. Um, and uh, Emma Finn is an Irish artist who lives and works in London where she's currently working on a PhD. Uh, she uses a uh, moving image and narrative and aims to transport viewers to uncomfortable places that sit between reality and invention. Emma's undertaken residences at the Bank Centre of the Arts, Airy Gallery in Kofu City, Japan, and the Cité Internationale des Arts Paris, as well as undertaking commissions for Edinburgh Art Festival and CW+. Emma was a Kinross scholar in 2013 and um, I don't need to ask you where you are because I've just said you're in London and we know what time it is in London. But Emma, would you like to take it away? Yeah, sure. Um, let me just share my screen because I've got a, let me see. What? Desktop. Wait a second. Sure. My desktop's incredibly messy. Please ignore it. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Um, let's start with the first slide. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's so, good. Great. Um, so I can't cover, like the guys were just doing, we can't cover everything that's happened to us in the eight to decades since we've done this. Um, but I was hoping to be able to give a bit of a spotlight to some of the works that were informed by my time there. Um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, point out that being awarded the scholarship gave me a plan for the future and really helped um, my confidence in myself. Um, I was notified of it just as I was graduating from the BA, a time when many students feel um, scared because you're outside the comfort of the art school. Um, and it was the validation of support that I wish all graduates could receive. Florence has really sustained me as an artist, not just in terms of motifs and forms and studies, but also the confidence that started and fostered in me. Um, if I boiled my work down to, let me see, I'm just trying to slide through and it's not letting me. There we go. Uh, there we go. If I boiled my work down to the simplest form, just one word, it would be anecdote. From a young age, I've been fascinated by stories, especially absurd anecdotes. So what is an anecdote? It's a short, amusing, interesting story about a real incident. Um, but they count as regarded as unreliable, unreliable or hearsay. It's why it's not history. Um, this is why it's not considered historical fact. For example, babies being sent in the post. Um, it's early, it's uncommon, but it occasionally practiced in the United States and other countries before there was laws that lot. Um, when I was emerging from my BA, I had developed this method where I took these anecdotes uh, and I investigated them by drawing from the different perspectives of the individuals involved. In this example, the baby, the children, the postman. It was a way I like to think about the process and I like to imagine these two dimensional beings that I was drawing as um, having their own say in what was going to happen to them. I refer to them as the marks. These marks became people and things that had stories that their own to share. Wrecking balls, postmen, babies. The marks might seem just like marks on the page, but for me, they took on a collaborative role within my work. I would write their dialogues beside their images in an automatic writing method that really opened myself up. This process would eventually lead to videos I would make of the marks world using live action animation, as I called it. When I applied to Florence, 
I wanted to study the ceiling frescoes in particular. I thought that these, when we gazed up at them, they were gazing back at us in the same way that when I was looking at a sketchbook, the marks were looking back at me. I was interested in the exchange between these two dimensional forms from the 2D to the 3D and time-based 4D. But what I was most looking forward to was the space to explore my relationship with the marks outside the confines of school. At first I did look at the frescoes, but as is the way with proposals and artist residencies, it evolved. I was drawn instead to the streets and the local people. Um, it was like I would just watch and listen and study them as much as I could, as well as the paintings and museums and the sculptures in the streets, women selling clothes, men walking by carrying small stairs. The city's opulence, um, its design, its strong light and crowds were exciting, but at times overwhelming. Um, I arrived in the midst of the summer heat. I found a routine. I would wander the streets and museums early morning before the heat took hold. And in the baking afternoons, I would stay inside drawing and writing based on the art and the happenings in the streets that day. I would sometimes watch Fellini films like The Clowns. Before this, my film influences mainly involved animation and films from Japanese cinema. The evenings were spent with my fellow scholars, peers, Kate and Stephanie. It was idyllic until it wasn't. I was in Florence when my grandmother, Sarah O'Toole, passed away. Suddenly the city was too bright. I left to join my family and for the wake and the funeral. I returned to Florence after the proceedings and I retreated inside, the grief overpowering me. Slowly I emerged and drawn, I was drawn to watch the elders around Santa Spirito, the square I live near. There was a man that would sit on the square with his parrot every morning reading the paper. It was as if he didn't even notice the part was there. I delved deeper and deeper into the works of the Marx and translated my grief into a video work called More or Less. More or Less is set in a lecture hall with the students watching a video of an interview with a professor and a theorist. He is promoting a social experiment on splitting his time inside and outside his home. He explains and defends the social experiment with tales some of his own and some that he might have imagined. The scenes go back and forth between the classroom hosting the interview to the inside of the video in the professor's memories. The dimensions shift and settle from 2D to 3D to 4D. The people involved become less distinct and more or less the same. The work was visually more complex to the previous work to date and to make made for much larger scope and storytelling. And I think Florence helped prepare me for this in this regard due to the opulence around me. For the first time, the anecdotes inspiring me were personal. My experience in Florence would appear like the older man in the parish, but instead it would be an older woman. I played the part and was reminded of my grandmother. Once back in Edinburgh, I revisited my sketchbooks from my time in Florence almost as a direct counter to the hot base and heat of the city and the grief that I had pulled towards in drawing and writing, I then drew mountains and clowns. It was from this that I developed my first major work, Double Mountain. I was invited and commissioned by the Edinburgh Art Festival to develop this work as part of the Improbable City program in 2015. Mountains, places by their very nature, create boundaries and divide up space. The marks were up in those mountains, dwelling on how to get out of broken cable cars, find lost tickets and reach those base camps. It was through this body of work, I realized something fundamental about my practice. I knew anecdotes were the starting point of things, but it, it always eluded me, why was I so tied to one and not another? Why this anecdote and not that one? It hit me when I was making Double Mountain and reflecting back on the previous works that I was exploring mistakes, black holes in communication and working to make knowledge. The key word was transmission, the desire to connect, to be understood and to grasp communication. Between 2015 and 2017, I was lucky enough to be funded by various organizations, including Creative Scotland Banff Arts Centre and the Great British Sawaka Foundation to have long periods of artist residencies in both Banff Centre for the Arts and Kofu Yamanashi residency in Japan. 
The time in Florence helped me realize that residencies are instrumental to my practice. And I believe this time prepared me for future opportunities. In 2017, I began a master's for moving image at the Royal College of Art. It pained me to move away from Edinburgh, which had been my home for seven years, but I looked forward to the challenges it would bring. I decided to tackle communication and transmission head on during my time there as a concept in my work, which resulted in my video work before Colloquy. The video premiered at Glasgow International by invitation from curator Deborah Jackson and Map Magazine in 2018. Some backstory. Growing up in Ireland, I would walk to this strange egg-like structure in the bog. I learned later that this is the marker for the Marconi wireless station. It was the site of the, both the first transatlantic wireless signal, but also the first transatlantic flight landing. The station used massive metal plates to tune uh, and send signals across the sea. This meant it was incredibly loud around the station, deafening even when, e e deafening even when it was built in an isolating place. The workers lived many miles away in makeshift cabins. The station burnt down during the Irish independence as the British troops hid behind its doors. This was a place that pulls people together and pushes them apart and away. Before Colloquy, the film that I made, is the story of the Galway wireless station being rebuilt in the distant future. The people can now telepathically communicate over short distances, but have lost the use of their tongues and weakened their ears. Men and women were created by the people to work in the noisy station, but they are just fleshy machines. The only humans are the technician and her young assistant left nearby to tend to them. When I, this is when I started to see a change in my visual language. I broke away from black and white being present at, even in a small bit. I'm still working in drawing and writing, but now there's color and richer elements. When I was in Florence, I attended an exhibition about Japan's influence on Russian art at the turn of the century. Not only did the gestures and the forms inspire me, I was, this interest took me to look at other parts of Russian um, painting, including the Russian revolutionary painting and print work, which I'm particularly moved by Alexander Donetsk's textile workers from 1927. These influences have filtered into my work since Florence. Recently, I had the opportunity awarded to me to spend some time at the Cité International des Arts in Paris. I went to Paris to research the snail telegraph. Yes, you heard me correctly, a snail telegraph. It is arguably the first wireless internet conceived in 1883. It was tapping into that romantic era, capitalizing on the rise of the occult to reach into the unknown, harnessing the sympathetic power of native snails. The idea was that once snails had sex, they were connected forever. And in doing so, people could create small watches and connect and send text messages to each other. That was what was written about in the papers. And that is why the device got funded because everybody wanted to communicate from long distances wirelessly. While in Paris, I collaborated with philosopher Justin E. H. Smith on making a film that I eventually called The Sympathetic Machination. Smith is an expert on the device and throughout the film guides us by voice and presence to the technological premise. Here you see him as a snail. Although the device is over hundred years old, today witchcraft has returned to our culture as we scramble to understand the new patterns of understanding. The climate has changed where now traditional narratives and knowledge making are failing politically and socially. Today, I'm continuing my research into devices um, but I'm mostly focusing on devices that have been lost, much like the snail telegraph or the Marconi wireless station, things that have been dismissed as anecdotes or failures. But these misfires of transmission and media between humans and nature have surprising links back to animism and coincidence. And for me, there is still rich media history there to unpick, which is what is the basis of my PhD. Um, I know that that's sort of jumping over a couple of different parts of work. Um, but for me, it was important to show, like, even though at Florence, I felt like at the time it was a mixed bag between, you know, this 
brilliant time to just sit and absorb and write and draw. Then the grief came. But at the same time, it's, it's it, the, the time in Florence has been a gift ever since because it kept pointing me in directions of different artists and um, different influences that I wouldn't have come across otherwise. Um, I still think about it and I'm really grateful that I was able to do this talk today because it gave me the opportunity the last few weeks to think about my time there and really see how it's continuing to enrich my life. Um, I just want to thank again everybody at the RSA for letting me take part and um, yeah that's it I think. <laughs> thank you Emma that's really nice and actually what you were saying at the, right at the beginning about validation just at that really critical moment that's something that has come up over and over and over again as scholars saying that that feeling of validation you, you know you're used to being a student and you know what your tutors think and tutors are human subjective human beings so to have this external validation is is quite a boost yeah. I think. it gives you the confidence just to kind of go out and do things and also apply for other things that you want to do yeah. because i think one thing that everyone in this group seems to have is um, their work has taken them outside of Scotland and the UK on occasion a lot. So, you know, doing that, it, it's, it takes a certain amount of confidence to be able to apply and to plan a project um, for our field. And I think that the John Ken Ross Scholarship really sets us up for that, um, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Big thanks to the Ken Ross family. <laughs> um, but, but thinking about your time in Florence, I'm also quite interested in this you you actually went home in the middle of it because of your your grandmother yeah i went um, home for um less than a week and then yeah. Came back. yeah was was that strange that sort of own context and strange context and yeah i i found sort of yeah i mean i'm catholic so it was really interesting coming back to florence and going to the churches and lighting candles for my nan um but then there's sites of there are sites of worship, but they're mostly spectacle um, because of how many people are there visiting and tourism. And I remember um, get one day getting quite upset because I was crying just, just a little bit. And um, somebody kept taking my picture in the church. Um, so I think, I think that might've started to influence me starting to retreat into the, into the, the flat by the, you know, where I was staying during the day. But then at nighttime I would go out and I think, and I would, I would <laughs> in very broken um, Italian, sorry, speak to the elders in the square in the mornings when it was, when it was a little bit um, less warm and overwhelming. But um, I, think, I think one thing that set me up for though is that like, you know, life happens even if you're away on residency and you're working, you know, these things, these, these factors come into your life. And um, one thing that happened through that is I became much more comfortable with working with the personal within my practice whereas before that I wouldn't have been um so I think that was a yeah that was part of it going back after having that little mini jump home and come back in the middle of it yeah I, I think there's a big thing that happens when you leave college as well when you suddenly realize you're either gonna have to be an artist for the rest of your life or not <laughs> and if you are uh, sort of understanding that you know it, it had better be pretty good what you <laughs> what you're going to make your art about and, and your own life is probably the thing that uh, you're, you're the biggest expert. well it creeps in even if you don't want it to sometimes but um it's 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 uh yeah it's an interesting i mean i went from like the most recent project um sympathy machination i went from working with in the past um completely characters in my books to then making those live action to now working with people who actually are alive and exist and have some agency within the work, not just but not just in terms of being interviewed, but also behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, so for me, that's been, I think that's some of those kind of inclinations started when I was in Florence because of the others I was with, um, Stephanie and Kate. So it was, it, I don't know, it's, it's been um it's been interesting looking back on that time because I haven't thought about it for a little while. Um, yeah. You know, especially with the lockdown. <laughs> time to think yeah exactly <laughs> uh, 
Okay, um, I wonder if uh, we haven't got any questions on the chat or the Q&A, everybody's very relaxed and just watching tonight, um, but I wonder if any of the uh, speakers have any questions for each other before we wrap up at all. Are you, are you there, other speakers? <laughs> we're here. Yep, we're here. I think both of those were really, really interesting. I love the, the versatility we've had this evening as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when when I was re researching this project, which is, I mean, there is the exhibition at the RSA and these events, but we, we're also sort of build it, building an archive uh, and have been tracking down as many scholars as possible and asking, you know, for their experiences. And uh, it was such an if affirming experience, actually, just, you know, on Google, looking <laughs> looking for people and tracking them down, how many people have uh, gone on to make careers in, in the arts, you know, sort of decades, decades on and that you've spread all across the world. We've got scholars in almost every uh, continent and working in all sorts of different bits of the arts from galleries to engage practice to, you know, uh, to two of you particularly think about environmental issues. Um, it, it became a bit of a sociological study of the arts scene, I suppose, just to see where people had gone from that moment when we're all sort of the same as we graduate. So I don't know if any of you had any other... Uh, I was just going to say, during my talk, I mentioned the, the book and the, the piece of text featured. I'm just going to put a link inside the chat to a, a PDF copy of that book. So it's... Oh, that's great. If you just scroll down a little bit, it's on it's the fourth book down on that page there inside the chat. And that should contain the whole book. If it doesn't, you're welcome to get in touch. Okay. I will also send now on my website because I I work with video and not just video, but narrative video. So <laughs> it's kind of hard talking about films that are 15 minutes long <laughs> when <laughs> with a with a picture. But if anyone would like to, um, there's some on my website. And if there's anything that you can see on my website, I'm very happy to send you a link to the full videos. I, I must say, I enjoyed those videos a lot when I was <laughs> doing my researches. <laughs> do, do you want to put your website up there too, Kellen? Just so we've Why not? Yes, I'll send Yeah, kellenbricker.com. Um, I have some of the projects I spoke about tonight. Um, and other things I've been doing in the time since. Um, as Emma said, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's been at least 10 years for the for all of us, actually, doesn't it? So Close uh, it's hard to compress, yeah. compress things into that. Um, but also, as, as both of you are saying, it still is an experience I think about a lot. I still do think about Florence a lot, more than any other sort of residency I've done yeah. or any other project for some reason. Yeah. I think it might partly be what you're saying about it being just after college and mm. this first moment where you're really, you really are an artist or you're, you know, you sort of have to be not an art student anymore. Um, yeah, something like, about that very special. Was wonderful, wonderful freedom. And also um, I think it gives you a sense of confidence because, you know, you're given a certain set budget and everyone does differently with it. Some people, you know, um, like David, you've, you've made an ama amazing amount of work while you were there, paintings and on different materials. Um, and some of the others I was with, you know, they were doing videos and things like that. Um, I think that, you know, we end up doing what we think we should do with it. They were given that trust by the RSA. So, you know, some of us club together and have flats together, or some people might decide they need like a studio space. Um, one thing I've noticed is I do seem to, like Cullen was saying, like, it's the place that I remember. And like, weirdly, I still have dreams about the light there because it's just quite um, shocking. The, the, like the light compared to anywhere else um but you know one thing um that was also nice about it was the fact that uh, the other residencies I've done and things like that they've been great because they've been production based like I go there with the plan to finish something in a set amount of time with facilities but what was really beautiful about the time of Florence was it was just time to just completely absorb everything around and take it in and take it home and then then make work and then I think a few months later I made more or less but um, 
I think that's what's really great about it. Um, there isn't this like pressure to exhibit that month after, you know, you can really sit on it and um, let it absorb. And that's probably why we remember it so much more than other residencies. <laughs> time to take it in uh, and, and unfortunately at the time you don't realize how rare it is to be just allowed time time what a great gift uh, anyway thank you all very much indeed uh, it's been really really interesting and uh, one day maybe we'll all be in the same country and be able to to meet face to face